Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Doug Brunke. I'm the CEO founder of Global Chamber. We have a very distinct honor today to be speaking with experts uh, around growing your business globally. Um, Blue Marble Global Payroll uh, is uh, a spectacular organization that is located around the world to help companies grow around the world, just like Global Chamber. Uh, we're in 525 metros. Uh, Blue Marble uh, aspires and is has connections around the world in 525 uh, metros as well. Uh, and today we're going to be tapping in to their connections, to their knowledge, and to three experts uh, that we have here uh, on online. First, I would like to introduce uh, Victor Lobo. Victor Lobo is Senior Vice President of Marketing and Sales for Blue Marble Global Payroll. Uh, he'll be giving us uh, an overview, some background. He'll be talking about trends and challenges. Victor, could you kick that webinar off today, please? Sure, Doug. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, good evening. Uh, Doug, in, in looking at our client, uh, Blue Marble Client Trends, we have often seen a continued investment in international expansion. Uh, many of our clients are expanding for the first time. While, uh, while clients have already had international presence, are finding that they're growing within that market space as well. Uh, countries that we see expansion that are happening frequently are Canada, within our client base, Canada, Mexico, Netherlands, Germany, Ireland, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, India, Australia, South Africa, and Brazil. I've covered a range of countries, but those countries have seemed to be uh, popular growth strategies for our, many of our clients. Um, China, Malaysia, UK, and Mexico, Canada have seen increased headcounts within companies that already have established uh, entities there. So in, within those countries, we see a lot of growth uh, uh, within, their, uh, within their entities. Uh, some of the primary reasons for expansion we're finding is that uh, companies are trying to find um, great talent abroad. Um, they want to test that new market for distribution and sales of their product or services. And also, you know, uh, uh, the, the salary and the cost implication of, of having an employee could be lower abroad than in the U.S. market. Um, so companies have to consider many aspects of global expansion, including how to launch, how to stay compliant, and how to hire and, and staff global employees. The, uh, the other trend that I see is um, with companies who already have international presence is uh, they want standardization. They want uh, global standard, standardization to access data points, and they want it instantaneously for reporting. They want it for analysis. They want it for forecasting. And so they want to get away from having uh, data points from their payroll and from their, from their finance in multiple different softwares and, and, and formats into one consolidated format. So there's some of the sense trends that we're seeing within our client base. Uh, in looking at some of the challenges, um, you know, I find that often when we talk to payroll managers and HR managers that work with us, uh, they're often the last people to know about the global expansion strategy that their executives have implemented. Uh, and they said, here we go, go ahead, go ahead and do this. You know, many have told me that, uh, you know, their, their senior executives have made an acquisition or made an offer to an employee internationally, uh, or they're planning on sending an employee abroad uh, to open up a new market. And they say, oh, here we go. They start next week. Uh, you need to pay them. And, uh, you know, it's a very hard thing to do. So, uh, you know, oftentimes they're looking for guidance and expertise and how to, how to be compliant, how to, how to handle an expat, and how to, you know, how to work within this new country. Many of them don't have these expertise, uh, or if they do, they don't have it within the country that they're trying to expand in. Um, so that's one of the challenges that we see for exp uh, new expansion. Um, the other challenge that I hear from the same group is that, uh, you know, they want tools uh, to make their job easier, especially around global payroll. Um, the, 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 uh, these, these users have systems in place today that are, um, that are really uh, uh, superior in technology and very advanced for the U.S. market uh, with payroll, HRIS systems, and a lot of different modules. When you expand internationally, there's very limited tools or applications available, and they want to get away from making phone calls to a local provider or Excel spreadsheets or email formatting that's outdated. Uh, and so trying to find a system that can give them this, uh, this approach and still be a cost-effective formula compared to, uh, you know, enterprise model um, is also a challenge for them. It's a sometimes cost prohibitive to implement a technology. Um, and so they, still, they need to look wide, and there are providers out there, um, you know, um, Blue Marble is an example. Um, and some of the advice I can give is, um, you know, if you're really looking to expand, 
you know, obviously there's many reasons why you're doing it, but make sure it has a positive impact on your business. Um, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons. And then when you're doing it, make sure there's proper uh, resources allocated to the project uh, for the entire scope of the project, setting up the entity, banking, statutory regulations, um, benefits, employment contracts, all of those have to be considered. And, you know, just make sure you set up enough time and enough resources and have enough advisors uh, to do it properly so that you're paying the first employee correctly the first time. Very good. I think I, one of the things you mentioned there about doing it for the right reasons, I mean, certainly um, selection of where you go is, is critically important. Where are some of the better places uh, to, to go at this point? What, are there some easier places uh, to go around the world? Yeah, I think I just mentioned some of the, uh, some of the places I just highlighted. Um, I think John may get into it as well, but again, Canada, Mexico, UK, Netherlands, Germany, um, Ireland, um, uh, uh, Asian, country, uh, Asian countries, Hong Kong, Singapore, those have had a lot of uh, uh, growth uh, in the past year with our client base. So the good news is that um, uh, you've got, you've, you watching the, the webinar today, you've got the capability now to extend your business around the world. Uh, the right reason, uh, growth. You know, over 85% of business opportunities in the next five years will be outside the U.S. So if you're an American company and you are familiar with the 1960s and 1970s, those days are over. You know, the most of the opportunity is somewhere else. And so the good news is today we're discussing ways that you can legally, safely, with low risk, get to these other locations. Thank you, Victor. Really appreciate your, your, your knowledge and, and the over, overview that you've just given. My pleasure. Our next speaker uh, with uh, Blue Marble Global Payroll is John Galvin, uh, uh, Consultant of the Year. Congratulations, John, on your award. Uh, you're going to be sharing uh, some, some of your expertise today. You're going to be talking more about uh, in depth on uh, some of the things that Victor has already started uh, chatting about. We're going to be talking uh, while, John, you are talking, we're going to be posting to the viewers uh, three polling questions. So those of you who are viewing, you can see on your screen right now how likely are you to expand globally in the next six months to a year. If you would click on that uh, and you'll see a couple more when John is speaking, uh, please uh, do so. And uh, we'd love to be able then to, at the end of this webinar to, to recap those of you and kind of where you are in your global adventure. John, you see people making all, all sorts of adventures from wherever they are around the world. You're based, I believe, in the UK, but you work globally. Uh, tell, us, tell us more about some of, some of these issues that Victor has already started uh, talking about. Sure, well, Doug and Victor, thank you very much. Um, so I am based in the UK, um, as Doug says, and I work with Blue Marble basically to help clients on a wide range of kind of more consulting type issues um, that really, I guess, facilitate um, them setting up their overseas payroll. So I just want to spend the next, say, 20 minutes or so just talking about a few issues that we find really do um, cause a lot of um, issues for our clients. We can help them with and things that you know, a lot of people just really want to know before they get going. So I guess the first thing really is um, like there's already a, com a theme that's um, been touched on by Doug and Victor. Let, let's not make this any more difficult than it needs to be. And these days there's plenty more international solutions that make it easier for you to set up overseas. Now, I think one of the things that stops a lot of corporations, a lot of executives, you know, who I talk to, um, you can hear it in their voice. When you're talking about overseas, you're going outside your comfort zone. So one thing is how can you take the fear, how can you de demystify going overseas and make it just like normal business process? Because as Doug says, the growth opportunity here is fantastic. And if you can work out how to do this, how to expand overseas well, you've got a big advantage on many of your competitors, whatever industry that you're in. So 
I guess there's three things I'd like to touch on about how you make it easier. First thing is really, um, look, you know, we will be talking a lot here about compliance, but you want to, you only uh, involved in overseas compliance because you've got commercial goals to fulfill. And what are the key steps that you should think about when you're, um, from a commercial perspective, when you're expanding overseas? And this implies whatever country you're looking at. So I would say, just think about six or seven kind of key things from a commercial point of view. If you've got all of these considered, then you're on the right road. If you haven't got any of them considered, then just make sure, um, make sure you know you look out and just get them covered. Okay. So first one is, look, do your homework, do your market research. We've already talked already about um, what are the right countries to expand in. Now the one thing I would say is it's got to be right for your business. So do your market research. There's plenty of tools to show, okay, what, how big is the potential opportunity for your product or service in each given market out there? And also how to make it easy for yourself. Are you already getting lots of interest from customers in a particular market? If so, you know, can you work out why? And because that could give you a big clue again about where to go first. Prioritize your markets. That's the second step. Make it as easy for yourself as possible. Like follow some simple ground rules, like the closer you stick to home, the closer you stick to your usual language. Very simple, commonplace, bread and butter, things like this. Do make it easier. Um, Think about what sales channels you're going to work from overseas. You know, what works for you ideally? Um, think about how you're going to, you know, if you're supplying product particularly, what are the supply chain issues you're going to be um, faced with? Don't just assume international supply chains work. You know, we'll come on to that in a bit um, because that can really you know, tie up your product. If you've got something stuck in customs, um, then you know your customers don't get the delivery when they expect. Make sure you're the ones who, whose customers get their product on time. Then resourcing. Now you've got a big issue when you um, think about setting up overseas. What resources do you use? Do you use your own staff? Do you use retail? Do you use distributors? Do you outsource? Whatever. They've got pros and cons. Your own staff um, will give you more experience with your own systems, processes. They'll understand your objectives, but they may not have the local knowledge. Um, using local distributors, they've got all the knowledge in the world locally, but they sell other people's product too. They take um, a lot of your margin. No, there's no one right size fits all answer. You've got to just work through things, do your homework, and come up with the best answer for you. And the last thing I would say just on the, this point is you know, think about your on the ground setup as well. Just practical stuff like how about your local office, your local telecoms, um, money movement, how are you going to get money into the country? Just little things like those. Um, you know, a lot about expanding overseas is just about good, um, careful project management. Now, in terms of compliance, there's plenty to do that you can make your life easier with. Um, but I'm just going to touch a little bit now on what are the key things you should think about. And firstly, again, if you're supplying product, think about customs, think about trade tariffs, think about taxes, think about um, you know, the forms and regulations you'll need to get customs through. Now, if you know all the answers to those already when you're thinking about going overseas, then um, you're probably one of a kind. The thing to do is to find the expert who does. You don't need to know all the answers yourselves. Legal and tax issues um, are bound to come into play, and you've got to think about them. And when you're thinking tax, remember there's four types of tax. Again, whatever country you're looking at that you need to think about. Think about income tax, sales taxes potentially, withholding taxes, and also payroll tax. You've got employment law and HR to think about. You've got payroll, 
accounting may be an issue for you as well overseas. Um, you've got banking and FX and also any particular regulations that may apply to your industry. But the one thing then, no, you know, you've now gone through the checklist, you've got a, now got a good idea of all the things you need to think about when you're setting up overseas. But the last thing is, what, how do you find a great partner or partners to help you? And again, whatever service you're looking at, be it payroll, be it supply chain, they should have these following characteristics. They should have relevant experience helping international companies like you. They should have strong communication skills in your language. If someone cannot communicate effectively with you in English, um, you know, written or spoken, that is going to be a big problem for you at some point down the line. They need a great service ethos. You're going to be depending on your overseas partners. So they need to know that and really give you great service. And they should own your business overseas. They should take pride in doing that and ideally provide as many services in one shop as possible because the more people you've got to talk to to organize stuff overseas, the harder it is. So then I'll just move on to quickly to how you, you know, you know you've decided to um, employ your own staff. How do you keep the cost down of your overseas staff without compromising compliance? So again, a couple of kind of key tips that just, um, again, sound obvious. And remember, nothing is too simple or straightforward when you're thinking overseas. Do the simple things right, and you'll be a long way there. So for example, can your overseas staff work from home? Many of you, when you think of setting up in a new country, you'll be thinking about just putting in one or two employees first off, in which case, why do you need an office? You know, with um, telecoms tools these days, you know, um, working from home is a great alternative and really keeps costs down. Local employment contracts are really important. They can be an upfront cost. And remember, the culture internationally is that in most countries, employment contracts are pretty standard. Your future employees will expect you to have them. But the way they can work for you is because they set out all the local employment rules and regulations, they can help you stay exactly what you want. They can also make it, uh, the cost of overseas benefits very visible. Overseas benefits can be 30 to 40 percent potentially of the salary bill. They're higher than in the US in most international countries. So by uh, tracking them on an employment contract, they'll you'll make sure that you understand all the liabilities, all the benefits that um, are expected there. And then once you know about them, you can manage them. Um, if, again, your overseas operation will be a bit small, then how about getting your employees overseas to take out their own benefits plans rather than have you buy them? So for example, a local pension plan or medical plan. We're seeing this in a number of countries right now, and it's a, a great tip to really reduce um, administration costs as much as anything. Um, I know that Steve will talk a lot about um, legal entities, but um, one thing I would flag up is that in, you know, depending on the country you are expanding to and the type of operation you've got, you can potentially avoid having legal entities and um, still be totally compliant as an employer. For example, um, by just having a payroll registration. Now that's not a choice that's open. That will, to you, you can't just decide to do that. That really depends on the compliance rules in the country you're looking at. But again, even if, for example, you don't um, you know, you need like a representative office rather than a full legal entity. That avoids you paying uh, corporate income taxes and having to do financial statements in most countries. So there are a number of different options around there that um, may be applicable to you. So now I'd like to go on to uh, so five of the best countries to expand in overseas. 
And when I was writing this, I didn't realize that Doug and Victor would have stolen my thunder so comprehensively already. Um, but I'm going um, to I'm going to talk a, a little bit about um, these five, and I'm going to go into um, a bit more depth as well. Um, and in no particular order, the one I would say, um, particularly with this audience in mind, first off, is Canada. Now, why? Um, now, Canada, uh, again, is a, a huge market, um, 35 million affluent people, and it's right on your doorstep. Again, the easier, um, the, so the closer uh, your market is, the easier it is for many reasons, both in terms of logistics, time zones, all sorts of ways that um, you know, just help. So with Canada as well, you've also got NAFTA the North American Free Trade Agreement, that not only reduces tariffs on um, products, it essentially has the philosophy that means that anyone trading with Canada from the US, you know, in Canada you get often the same protection that an in-house Canadian company would do. You know, so you avoid a lot of the protection that you might see overseas. Now that's not to understate, there are many different things about Canada. It's Again, employment rules, etc., payroll, it's very different. There, um, for example, workers' comp is provincial-based. Uh, every province in Canada has its own scheme. Uh, they're publicly funded. That, I think, is unknown to about 80% of the U.S. clients that we talk to who are planning to set up in Canada. Um, but, but there's a great tax treaty as well with the US and Canada that really can reduce a lot of your tax and compliance costs there. Um, so the other obvious one also for that is Mexico. Um, much larger, 125 million people, you know, um, in many areas a lot less affluent, but particularly from a supply perspective has great advantages and also increasingly as a market for your goods and services as well. Mexico is an incredibly, sorry, is one of the most sophisticated trading economies in the world. It has free trade agreements with everyone. It's a very, very international and open market. Germany is my next choice. 65, sorry, 80 million people the largest market and the richest market in Europe, slap bang in the middle of Europe, incredibly confident, great place to do business, has a very particular culture. Um, it is much less flexible from a service perspective, I find, but from a product perspective, great. They set very high standards and they love great products from anywhere around the world. Um, can be a lot easier to set up in Germany than you think, particularly the employer registration route I mentioned. Now, one other option with, the, with Germany and many of these countries internationally is if you set up an entity there, even though it's foreign owned because you own it, having that local entity gives you many of the same rights as a local business. So think about that. That can be a really, really good option for many reasons. I've, I'm totally biased, of course, so I'm about to mention the UK, even though I'm just going to talk about Brexit in a minute. But whatever happens with Brexit, the UK is just such a business-friendly environment. It's incredibly entrepreneurial, attracts a whole heap of great talent. So as Victor mentioned, if you're looking to attract a good talent pool, the UK is, is a really, really strong, thriving, multicultural environment, but also the fastest growing economy in the G7 this year. And London is an international city you know, like virtually no other. Now, the last one that I will put in there is Singapore. Singapore is just an absolutely ideal place to expand into Asia from. Remember the whole, you know, 50, 60 years ago, Singapore was a swamp and Singapore has raised itself from that status by following amongst other things, a very, very international, business-friendly um, regime. It um, is totally geared up to attracting foreign investment and making it easy for you to set up there and trade in Asia from Singapore. 
Now, the last thing I'll touch on is, of course, we've got to have some hot politics in here right now. So why not talk about the impact of Brexit on you guys as you're thinking of expanding to Europe? Maybe some of you are already there. So what does it mean for you? So first thing to say is Brexit, for, uh, just in case there's anyone in the, the audience who doesn't know, what does Brexit mean? It's the, basically Britain pulling out of the European Union. Now, this has not happened yet, and it's not going to happen for about two years. So the, um, it's likely going to happen in March 2019. But when it does, it will have a big impact, and it's already having a big impact, I think, on US investment into Europe. 40%, that's 40% of US foreign direct investment into Europe has recently been via the UK. The UK has been an incredibly popular choice, but Brexit does make it, that choice a little more difficult for you know, US investors right now. Why is that? The reason is because as part of the European Union, the UK has access to the single market and a free trade area, and the UK will lose that by pulling out of the EU. It's not definite, but it's looking extremely likely. It's also looking uncertain right now exactly what regime, trading regime, will replace that. No one really knows. It's possible, unlikely, we all hope, but possible, there could be no trade deal between the UK and the EU when the UK leaves. In that case, the UK and EU would fall back on World Trade Organization rules. Essentially, lots of tariffs and no free movement of goods because customs would apply. But there are also many other possibilities. The problem for business decision makers right now is we don't know. It also has a big impact on people because um, it, there, there's free movement of labor across Europe. Now, one other thing to say, though, is that it will have, um, again, this is a matter of contention, but I think the generally accepted view is it has less, Brexit has less of an impact on the EU, on continental Europe than it will do on the UK. So if you're worried about the EU um, economy suffering majorly as a result, that may be overblown. Um, and uh, you know, we mentioned Ireland earlier. Ireland will be heavily, heavily affected by Brexit because so much of Ireland's trade and customs goes through the UK. And this could potentially, worst case, lead to a hard border again within Ireland, which has lots of negative social and political consequences. So anyway, I think that is me up in terms of my time. Um, so I will now hand back to Doug. Thank, thank you, John. Actually, you hit it right on, on the nose. And I do have uh, some questions that I'll save for the end. But I, I just have one quick one um, to, to ask relative to all of the different issues that you talk, talked about. I'm very interested to hear from you. Who do you normally work with at a company? Because you're talking, when you went through those issues, there were sales and executive type business decisions, marketing operations, finance, accounting, compliance, supply chain, logistics. We're going to talk about some legal things, service. All of these things typically are not located in one person. And so how does a company address all of these things, because not everybody's probably going to come up to speed all at once regarding the issues that you raise. How, how does that occur practically? Sure. I think um, generally uh, there's a kind of like a mini project team within a business. And we typically, particularly when we're looking at like payroll and compliance, we are typically talking to finance and HR. Um, okay. And that, is, that, that works really, really well because those two things, they are very, very bound up. But we do also work with a lot of smaller companies. Um, and in those cases, tip, often we do speak to CEOs directly. And that's when, of course, we get into more of the commercial issues kind of up front. 
um, particularly uh, handling sales taxes as well, customs, that type of thing. And we can get asked anything, Doug. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe. So, but that's the thing I think about having a trusted relationship and providing a real one-stop service is that you become a real port of call. And you know, when people ask us questions that we're not expecting, that's fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've taken a very complicated topic and, and, and boiled it right down, including Brexit, by the way. Congratulations on, on that explanation. Our, our next speaker um, is uh, Steve Wilson of Osborne Clark. Osborne Clark works with uh, Blue Marble Global Payroll. And Steve, today you're going to be getting a little bit more into the compliance and legal issues uh, uh, in depth. Could you could you take us uh, there uh, on some of those issues, and then when you're finished, we'll we'll have a Q and A question for for all of our speakers. For sure, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Doug. So, um, in in the same vein as, as John, um, I'll try and and keep things simple, um, even though there are obviously lots of variances depending on the circumstances of your business and, and which country that, that you're going to uh, be expanding your your operations into. Um, the first thing to say, I, I suppose, is you know, uh, John did pick up on, on at what point should, um, should, should you actually set up some sort of subsidiary or, or should you just um, sell your, your services or your products um, directly to, to your, your target audience. I think the, 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 the bottom line is there, is there is a legal and a tax um, trigger at which point um, you're somewhat required to um, set up a subsidiary. and. Um, the, 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 the phrase that, that you may come across um, relating to that is, uh, do you or do you not have a permanent establishment? So a permanent establishment, or PE for short, um, is really when, uh, it, it is, is one of those tax areas which can be somewhat gray because it, the answer in, in great legal kind of description is it depends. So the uh, very often you'll know when you have a permanent establishment because you'll have a number of employees, or you'll have a base, you'll have an office, you'll be marketing into the uh, the market in, in, in which um, the test is being run. And ultimately you will have an operation that the local tax authority will be seeking to, 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 to tax the profits of. Uh, various structures can be put in place in order to, to minimize that tax, but ultimately um, if you have some serious operations then it's expected that you will have registered in the proper way with the, um, with the local registry and uh, tax authority, um, etc. So it, it shows that there is somewhat um, uh, a, a, a decent presence um, in, from which you're, you're targeting your new market. Um, once you, you've established that you do have a PE or you're getting towards the point of having a PE, and by the way, there is no right or wrong answer, so there are many businesses that, uh, that, that avoid registering for, for a while and, and there are um, certainly ways of delaying putting it in place if, if you have concerns. But once you, you do um, uh, agree that you have the permanent establishment in place, that's the point at which you need to consider, well, do I put in place a, a subsidiary or do I operate a branch office? And there are some countries uh, where there is uh, different alternatives available as well. And I think John mentioned the representative office. So, so assuming that the main, the main choice is a subsidiary versus a branch office, a sub basically means you're going to put in place a brand new company um, that will be formed under the law of your new market. Um, the, the, the process to establish that uh, varies wildly. Um, the countries that uh, John and Victor both talked about in terms of the ease of establishment both have relatively straightforward um, processes for setting up um, a subsidiary and they can be done somewhat um, within a, a decent time, uh, a time um, frame. Other countries can take a much, much longer and some of them have obligations to set up a bank account prior to, um, uh, to, to, to the subsidiary being formed um, and may have other um, uh, obligations around notarization and, and other processes that may be unfamiliar 
um, if you're um, going into that market or, or going overseas for the first time. So um, it's worth exploring what it means to set up a subsidiary um, and ultimately um, uh, how long to expect that process to take. Pretty much guarantee it will, not, it will be a lot longer than you'll be used to when setting up a, a Delaware entity or a, another US um, a corporation. So once, once, once you've established that you're going to do a subsidiary, uh, sorry, the, the other alternative is the branch office. So the branch office really is just another office of your US headquarters. So to some people, they, they feel that that's a lighter touch because you're not putting in place a separate legal entity that has to comply with the local um, um, tax obligations, etc., for a subsidiary. However, regrettably, you won't be surprised to hear that even if you go for the light touch option, there are still registration processes in many countries. There will still be a tax filing that needs to be done. And all of that will relate to the global operations. So the operations of that office plus the parent company, which is often the US company. Most of the time, um, when we're speaking to clients about this, uh, the decision gets taken very quickly because there are a number of countries in which you're um, obliged to uh, make a filing, and the filing is financial statements, and for private companies in the US, you don't have any obligations to, 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 uh, to file that publicly, and so by having a branch office overseas where you might have to make that filing, you certainly don't want to share that confidential information. So it's a very, very often can be a quick um, decision to set up a subsidiary because the only filing you're making there relates to that overseas business that comes out of the subsidiary. So it's somewhat self-contained. And that actually that self-containment is probably the, uh, the main non-legal reason why you put in place a subsidiary rather than a branch. It's a, it's a, a standalone entity, which means if things were to go super wrong, then your, your liability generally is contained within that overseas um, entity and you can, if you need to, close it down. And very quick comment on, uh, just to, to, to back up sort of what John said around Brexit and if you're thinking about setting up overseas, I mean, a solution if you're looking at the UK and uh, the remaining EU is likely to be just setting up two entities. So it's not massively complicated. It ultimately depends on what you're looking to sell into in, in Europe. Are you looking to sell to the UK um, um, market or you're looking to sell to the um, EU market or to both. So if it's to both, then um, I'm, I'm sure many um, CPAs will come up with tax efficient structures that means you just put in place an entity in both locations. So moving on to, to, to whether to looking at the, the contract side of things, um, this is a, a very popular question for, for businesses that are operating overseas for the first time. And most of the time they would prefer to be trading, to be contracting on the, the contracts that they use back home in, in the US. And the quick answer to this, and of course there are lots of different angles to it, but the quick answer tends to be, um, if you are selling to individuals, if you're a B2C operation, vast majority of the time your, they, your consumers will be protected by the laws of the country in which they are resident, in which they are buying um, your um, product or services. So as a result, it's definitely, um, you should be aware that you're likely to have to localize your, your contracts um, and all your terms of service on your website uh, in that um, local uh, market. If you're um, selling to um, an enterprise, if you're a, a B2B operation, then at that point you'll, be, um, you'll have greater flexibility. It will be possible for you legally to trade um, your US contracts. However, just aware that there may well be some pushback, particularly with um, larger um, customers who will also use their own paper, their own contracts. And obviously, if they have the um, balance of, of power in that negotiation, you're likely to, to need to, to localize contracts. Localizing, in many cases, does not mean completely rewriting. Um, and very often, it's possible to regionalize contracts rather than have to um, uh, localize country by country, which obviously can be somewhat cumbersome, but also quite expensive. So there are solutions, particularly when you're explore, exploring a, a new market. Um, Outside of the, 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 the legal side of things, um, you should just be aware that particularly when dealing with individuals, you'll need to think about um, 
localizing language. So you'll, you'll have to actually um, translate your website into a local language. In, um, and there will be other cultural considerations that are, you know, your marketing team hopefully will be aware of. But obviously, the same culture doesn't apply around the world, nor does the language language, nor does the currency, and so nor does the law. So it's just worth um, and put, putting that into your strategic plan. Will you need to, 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 to localize? What will localize look like? Um, what's the minimum I suppose you can get away with? And then when, you're, when your um, customers are, are located in places such as Europe, there are likely to be other um, regulatory issues about, for example, um, around privacy and data protection. Many people are somewhat aware of, but it actually will often require changes to your site, to your platform, um, in order to comply with the privacy laws. You'll need to think about the way in which you hold data, why you're holding it, um, and there are other uh, registrations um, that you may need to, to, to look into. Um, the Privacy Shield may be uh, recognizable to you, which is but uh, the, the, the process by which you're able to transfer data from Europe into the US, which is otherwise um, illegal. So it's so worth just be, being aware of what your obligations are overseas. The minute you're trading overseas, you just need to uh, understand that there are likely to be local laws which you're probably unaware of or haven't come across before that you will be expected to comply with and failure to comply will lead to a minimum uh, a complaint by your customer or unhappy customers or, or failure to, to sell your product or service. And, and obviously it goes all the way up to um, enforcement proceedings and, and publicity and ultimately litigation. So clearly it's, it's better to spend time up front um, considering what the requirements are for the local market rather than stumbling across it by mistake. mistake. Moving on to the next one quickly, um, uh, John did talk about um, looking at employment laws and, and whether or not you should use contractors versus um, employees. I think the easiest thing to, to, to kind of bring a correlation here is is, is very similar between uh, W-2 and 1099 in the US. So if you feel as if um, a contractor is actually performing the services of an employee and they are dedicated to your business and they're spending full time um, operating, selling for you or doing whatever their role is for you, they're pretty likely to be an employee rather than a contractor. The downside of that, apart from all the usual issues that you would come across in, in the US, for example, back uh, payment of taxes and social security and all the rest of it, is that overseas employees tend to have much enhanced rights. And so if you have a contractor that turns out to be an employee and then terminates their, 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 their contract, they may well bring an employment action against you. And overseas employees know they have a, a greater rights and, and are often not afraid to, to use them. So just be aware that um, it's, it might seem a shortcut, at least to start with, and it might be a, a temporary solution, but over time, you should ensure that you have the, the, the correct paperwork in place, the right registrations in place. And as John mentioned, the contract is there to protect you as an employer. It also includes the, their terms of employment, but most importantly, it, it sets out what the terms are between you in, in, in that role. There are, there are kind of the, the middle ground aspects, and, and John also mentioned distributors and, and agents that can be put in place. Be aware that if you're using a sales agent to, um, to sell your, your products, um, or sometimes your services in, in Europe specifically, they may well be protected by what's called the commercial agency regulations. Very complicated um, laws applied in different ways, regrettably, across European countries, but ultimately it provides a effectively a contractor who you think is on a, a at will basis with um, termination rights that can be costly. Again, if you haven't checked up front, you haven't put the correct contract in place. So it's one of those areas where people tend not to be aware up front because they've given the contractor the US form. Um, of, of engagement and then it ultimately turns out that they are protected by, by these regulations and so again you won't find out until you're trying to terminate them and then when you try and terminate them that's when suddenly the lawyer will start mentioning these, these regs to you and the termination payment that, that becomes due. 
once you confirm that you have an employee that you are going to provide them with a contract, um, the contract absolutely must be subject to or governed by the local laws in which that person is resident. So they will be protected by their local laws and therefore you should have not only uh, a, a legal contract, but one that actually looks like, from a market perspective, a local contract. So as John mentioned, the employee will expect that. We have had situations where uh, US em uh, employers are concerned that they don't want to send a 20-page document to an employee because obviously market standard in the US is, is just two or three pages uh, in, and very often in letter form. But actually, if an, if an overseas employee receives that, it actually undermines the credibility of, of the employer of, of you trying to, to, to bring this person on board because they will be surprised that you haven't taken the formal engagement process of bringing that employee on board. And bear in mind that also will apply to what you pay them, the benefits you provide to them, and, and the general culture that you create for them. And the, the world is, is not flat in terms of those sort of things, and so it's very important to, to get the local insight in terms of what is normal, what is market standard, and very often it will, it will save you money because you can probably pay them less and probably give them fewer uh, benefits than you would be used to giving to your US employees. So worth thinking about that. And ultimately, if it gets to the point where you're um, needing to, to go your own way from your employee, you need to terminate them, the dismissal procedures are very, very important that you take local advice. Please do not um, just dismiss somebody um, employment at will does not exist outside of the US and so there will be a procedure, there will be a time frame, there will be payments. Sometimes the, the termination terms need to be approved by the local courts and sometimes they may even require the consent of a works council um, which can be which um, is, a, is a, an employee forum in larger um, um, European countries so be aware of that. Finally, um, I just want to pick up very briefly on um, whether or not it's better to grow organically or to um, acquire um, an overseas business by, by acquisition. If you set up organically, I think the advantages are definitely you're much more in control. So you can maintain the integrity of the overseas business, of your, of your US business, and you can grow it at the pace and with the people that you select. And, and you control the way in which the product or the service is being sold, the message that is, is, is being delivered to your ultimate customers. You can seek to replicate the culture, um, and that will often require a lot of management time and making sure that you're in market with your new team, which often will start off just with a couple of people, but you know, our experience is that they grow very rapidly, and so it's important that that culture is maintained in the right way for you. However, with that control, typically becomes a, a slower timeline because, of course, recruiting and building a presence and getting that profile in country will take time um, and effort on behalf of your, your team and on behalf of you from back home, which will be thousands of miles and multiple time zones away. So the alternative is often to buy an established business. Um, be aware that, unfortunately, the success rate of, the, of acquisitions is pretty low, partly because the integration process um, is shortcut and very often um, it becomes a standalone part of your organization being, being run by people who you haven't gotten to know. And so whilst um, it can establish uh, a greater presence immediately with an existing um, customer base, you just need to ensure that the, the new team that's in place understands what your, uh, your, your, your corporate ethos is, what the key issues are around their product and their services, and ultimately that they, they feel part of the new and large corporate entity. Um, be aware that if you acquire just business and assets rather than acquiring the stock or the shares in uh, an overseas business, there may be issues around particularly employees that can protect their employment um, from dismissal. So don't assume if you're going to um, acquire an overseas business that the first thing you're going to be able to do is massive, massively rationalize it um, because if you make any layoffs, there could well be financial and legal consequences to doing that. So again, be aware of that as part of your um, planning upfront. But ultimately, with that higher risk becomes the higher reward as well. So you, 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 you do establish yourself much more quickly overseas. And if, if the, the um, integration works well, then you have a very willing and able um, uh, overseas workforce uh, that is known to and has its own um, existing network with your customers.
Doug, I think that's back to you. Fantastic. Great, great information. Really appreciate that. Um, I've um, checked the Q&A area and so continue to ask uh, any questions that you might have. If we don't get to your question, you know, we'll have some contact information after the event and you'll be able to contact any of the speakers. And so I've been actually got a couple of texts here uh, from some of our members and I like to ask in the remaining time to Victor, John, and Steve, uh, a couple more questions if, if, as long as we have time. Uh, one uh, relates to uh, common mistakes. So uh, undoubtedly the people that you typically each deal with and certainly all of the Global Chamber members I've ever met are serious, knowledgeable, capable people. They're, they're not reckless, they're very thoughtful. Um, nonetheless mistakes get made right so what are some of the even with the people who are very diligent what are some of the more common mistakes hopefully ones that are uh, ones that can be avoided well shall I kick off with this one and I, I think um, one easy mistake to to avoid is really one of mindset um, and I guess the thing with international expansion is just if you can approach it just knowing that you don't know what you don't know okay the old rumsfeld rule um that's a really really important i uh, think thing to start with many clients do not many clients come at this from this a viewpoint where they think basically their default position is everything overseas works in the same way as in the us which is a very understandable uh point to start from but if that means that you're then not flexible and then not able to handle or you get frustrated when things are different, then that can be a problem. Now, part of the, your success and part of the benefits that you get from expanding overseas are really, um, you, know, you get exposure to different ways of doing things, you improve as a result. And remember that every country has you know its own rules and its own sovereignty and that's why these employment laws and um, payroll rules are different if you can kind of it's really hard but if you can kind of embrace them um, and work with them then I think that gives you a much greater chance of just coping with all the issues that you're going to face and you know learning from them yeah. so I'll now hand over to the others so just, 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 just to add to, to that, John, I mean, I, I would add that as well as not knowing what you don't know, I think a little bit of uh, knowledge can often be dangerous as well. Uh, and, and that particularly applies where you have a board um, with people who may well have um, uh, advised other businesses on overseas expansion or even been through it themselves. Um, and they have uh, they, they provide their either out of date or irrelevant advice to the board which often can can just be wrong because it's not the same uh, expanding into mexico as it is into france or to the uk or whatever um, and also if, if the last time you did it was 15 years ago regulation process and, and even just market standard um, changes significantly over that time so my advice would be to ensure that you're getting um, correct and up-to-date advice um, and, and just make sure that you plan it and you allow, allow enough time for the process um, because you know the, a lot of time and effort goes into establishing your domestic business so you should assume that um, establishing an overseas business in, in a market which you're less familiar with and you, and you have less direct uh, management time to, 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 to um, overview um, or provide overview um, will mean that it may well be more difficult. And so I, I think that very often people uh, are, are make the mistake in saying, well, we're just putting a couple of people on the ground. It's just going to be a sales operation. Let's do it really quickly and really simply. And sometimes that can come back to bite them. <clears throat> and on my, on my side, I find that Google sometimes is also very dangerous uh, for users. Um, you know, oftentimes we'll see them, they'll look at the first page, find some advice and Go to market strategy based on Google, and that's very dangerous. So I strongly ask that you leverage experts like John Galvin and Steve Wilson, and listen to them instead of uh, uh, first page of Google. Very good. Thank, thank you, Victor, and thank, thank, thank all of you. Another question that's related to that that I've received is the inverse question 
uh, Victor, that you had started um, and, uh, and John finished in, in more depth. So the opposite way is, and not to pick on any particular countries, but where have some of the more difficult, where are some of the more difficult countries and why? Uh, what, what are the issues that, that are particularly uh, tricky in some, in some places of the world? Okay, well, shall I start again? Um, I think, f first off, um, Africa, basically much of Africa is really, really tough. Um, and there, that's because of two things, really. Firstly, um, and again, like this is kind of pretty sweeping, but so please take this with a pinch of salt, as it were. But in many cases, there's such, such a strong um, culture of non-compliance with regulations. Let's just put it that way. And also, it's very easy to avoid complying with regulations. So what that means is two things. Firstly, it means that you can be at a competitive disadvantage if you follow the rules. Secondly, it means that you can be tempted, um, and I've seen this with some clients, to start asking, well, what if I don't follow the rules? And there, remember that the US you know, has very, very strong kind of anti-foreign corruption um, laws, et cetera, et cetera. So there. Um, so I think there, um, I mean, but there are other cases where what is a difficult country for one client could be much easier for another. For example, Japan is an awful lot easier if you have a Japanese a member of staff or if any country is, is easier if you can send one of your own staff over there as a knowledgeable expat. So there are ways of turning this. And remember, if you're, if you're finding it difficult, then your competitors are as well. So if you can crack it, it can give you a big competitive advantage. I see. Uh, Victor, Steve, anything to add? No, I, I agree with John. I think uh, we found that working with clients, um, the African countries have been most challenging to work with uh, in terms of cost and, and timing and compliance. And, 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 and as John says, there's so many different angles to it because, you know, you look at Brazil or, or India, then you have um, uh, issues around getting currency in and out of the country. You have corruption issues in places like uh, Russia, you have, even if you look at some of Europe, then the, the different challenges um, apply, which is more regulation that you have to comply with. And, and as we talked about, you know, dismissing an employee can become extremely complicated. So um, every country has its challenges, it is different. And so, you know, just being prepared and, and, and um, getting the, the upfront advice is, is key. So one that we we only have time for one one more question, and, and um, I, I think, and so we kind of went in a little bit of a negative place in terms of based on the question that, that that we asked around tougher places. I think those of us that are involved with international business recognize that there are challenges around the world, and yet most of the people that we work with are successful. And so, from your own experience. You know, what is the success rate for, you know, serious companies in their adventures around the world? Or do you, do you see um, early, in the early days, uh, failures that turn into successes? Or do you, do you typically see successes from the start? And what are some of the real key factors in terms of making sure that we get as close to 100% success as we can? Shall I make a, a, a quick comment on that one? I mean, I've, I've certainly seen that sales processes in, in certain countries and certain part, parts of the world um, can just take longer than it does in, in the US. And so with patients, um, some businesses that initially think that things are not going great actually turn around to be really fantastic um, success stories because they've just, they've given their sales teams time to build relationships and therefore you end up with some very loyal customers. And uh, whereas some people just don't have that patience and pull out really too early because their expectation is 
wrong in terms of how long it will take to establish a reputation and profile within a, within the new market. I, and I would add to that that I think absolutely patience is key. Um, and I would also add that I think you see that com uh, companies that are successful in one country tend to be successful globally or in a number of countries. And that is because they have learned to become international in their culture. You know, and those companies have a stronger talent pool because they've got more um, resources to pull from. And also they're more attractive to work for because let's face it, if you're an international company, it adds a lot to your um, valuation multiple. It makes you a much more attractive place to work for as an employer. Um, so I think there's something here around culture, just appreciating differences and just being really, really committed to um, making expansion work. Because if something doesn't work, doesn't go right first time, ask yourself why. Think, and if you can say, well, actually, do you know what? It was down to us. We should have changed our approach, had a bit more commitment, etc. Then just do it again. Um, and if you, you know, no, as we said many times in this webinar, there's no single one size fits all. You've got to work out the right approach for your company, but it's possible for any company to be successful overseas. So much of the key is how you run it. Great, great way to uh, to encapsulate it, Victor. Any any closing comments? No, I was going to say, you know, um, expansion expansion is great and exciting. We talk to clients and they're so energized about their expansion strategy, and, and it's. Um, it's really invigorating to a company to start looking at different markets. Uh, with that excitement comes fear, uh, and which, which is fine, which is great. Again, uh, my biggest advice is make sure you surround yourself with great advisors that will help you uh, so, you, so it doesn't have to be a, a fear factor, but also make sure you've set up realistic timelines uh, to, uh, to uh, launch a new strategy. All we have to fear is fear itself. There we go. And, and with that, I'd like to thank you, Victor, uh, John Galvin, Steve Wilson. Thank you to Blue Marble Global Payroll. Uh, for any questions that are still in the queue, uh, we'll be happy to answer them individually. Uh, contact us at info at globalchamber.org. Um, we will be putting up a blog here shortly around this conversation. Uh, we encourage you to jump in. Jump into Blue Marble, jump into Global Chamber jump into successful global business because it matters. It matters to the world and it matters to your business. Uh, we have at Global Chamber several things coming up, including access to capital events, including one in Denver on May 9th. We have one on manufacturing across continents between Asia and the Americas on June 8th. And we have events coming up on global women uh, in business and leadership, on sustainability, on business in India, in business around the world. And so uh, we really want to thank all of you for attending today and thank you um, and continue to stay engaged. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.